Good morning and welcome to the latest in the series of Alex Partners webinars. Today's webinar will focus on how to uncomplicate a carve-out. At a time when we see carve-outs becoming increasingly popular, whether that be for the acquiring businesses who are trying to accelerate their strategic growth in their portfolio, or maybe to establish their position in a new market, or whether it be for the selling businesses who want to strategically recalibrate and focus on what is core to them. So whether buy side or sell side, we're going to cover some of the key risks and tips for success. And there's three key messages we're going to focus on. The first is that, that no carve-out is the same. Carve-outs are complex and each one needs to be taken in its own right. Secondly, preparation is everything. And thirdly, a carve-out is about much more than getting to day one and separating the businesses. We're going to tell you more about the important aspect of the value creation that starts after day one. So we have a Q&A box if you want to post the questions. And if we don't make it to the questions in time, we promise to follow up afterwards. And just to let you know, this session is being recorded, uh, so you can play it back at your leisure. So let's start with some introductions. I'm Catherine Sherwin, leader of our digital and technology business across EMEA. And during my last 25 years across technology and IT, I've been involved with numerous carve-outs, both on the sales side and on the buy side. Let me hand you over to Mo to introduce himself. Good morning, Mo. Hi, Catherine. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mo Habas. Um, I'm a leader in our pan-European private equity practice at Alex, and I specialize in large and complex um, transformations, which includes invariably uh, carve-outs as well as integrations. And I focus on the private equity route to market, so I deal more on the buy side uh, of carve-outs. Morning, Nick. Good morning, Catherine. Hi, everyone. So I'm Nick Wood. I, I lead Alex Partners Industrial Corporate Finance Advisory Team. <clears throat> I advise clients on all aspects of M&A, but with a particular focus on sell side and carve-outs. Um, over the last 20 years, I've advised on numerous divestments ranging from standalone single entities to multi-division, multi-geography businesses. Um, and from a carve-out perspective, my role is to lead the sales process and negotiate deals on behalf of clients. As part of this role, I focus on assessing the industrial logic for deals. Ensuring business plans are credible and fully reflect the potential of the business. Positioning assets to ensure buyers are fully engaged, but ultimately to ensure that we maximise value from, from exits. So this morning, I'll be sharing some of the key considerations we work through from a sales side perspective. Okay, great. So let's move on and put into context why we're talking about carve-outs. Why are carve-outs such a hot topic right now on the m and landscape? Well, we've seen the buy-side funds raised in Europe last year increase by 30% compared to the previous year. And we saw the deal volume growth, the growth rate of deal volume increase by almost 20% in the second half of last year compared to the second half of 2019. And that's during a pandemic. So getting it right is critical. And therefore, some key things as to why preparation or what price you pay if you don't prepare. In fact, there was a survey recently by Merger Markets who said that for every three month delay, there's typically a 10% cost increase in the, in the budget. And also, nearly 80% of people asked thought that more preparation would have actually helped them and avoid some of the delays that they experienced. And finally, 50% of buyers thought that the absolutely important point was the design of detailed value creation plans in order to achieve a successful acquisition. So let's move on and talk about our first takeaway. Preparation is everything, and it's key to preventing failure. So Nick, if we look at the top half of this slide and we look at the, some of the sales side aspects, hmm. why don't you start and, and maybe take on the first one, lack of industrial logic? Yeah, sure. I think for me, Catherine, this is, this is one of the key questions that, that should be asked right up front before any time or cost is invested in carve-out activities. You know, does the deal actually make sense? You know, what is the likelihood of success of the sale? How, how does that should that be reflected in value expectations? I mean, quite often we see vendors 
they make a decision to, to exit. They have their own perception of their business, good or bad, you know, and they dive straight into the process. But rather than doing that, we encourage clients to make an objective assessment of the car, right? both from an internal but also from a market perspective. So what does this mean? Well, if you consider the car by entity, you know, does it have the right to be a standalone business? You know, can the market support another player? How will customers and suppliers react? What's the competitive landscape and, and how will competitors to respond to the car ride? And I think ultimately also from a buyer perspective, you know, what are the strategies that are being deployed by players in the market? Is there actually a buyer for the business? Now, understanding all these sort of objective considerations really helps us form a view on the likelihood of a sale, whether a strategic premium can be achieved. So I think early on, that objective assessment is really, really important. Um, the second point I'd highlight on this slide um, is, is also kind of a robust, compelling business plan, be prepared for the business. Um, you know, will the business plan be attractive enough to pique the interest of buyers, but at the same time be robust enough to stand up to due diligence? You know, all too often we've seen uh, even for the most you know well-respected brands or must-have assets, we've seen processes unravel because business plans are either just not credible or they can't support the vendor's value expectations. Um, this can ultimately lead to a lack of confidence in the business, a lack of buyer engagement, and ultimately the value you can achieve for the business. So, so for me, right up front, is the industrial logic sound? And is there a credible equity growth story for the business? Great, and I can hear that there's a dog in the background who's agreeing with us on that. Absolutely. <laughs> what about you then, Mo, from the buy side point of view? You know, separation complexity, how complex is it really? Well, it's uh, it's very complex. And I think anybody who assumes that it's an easy thing to walk into and, and get out of is, uh, I think, probably diluting themselves significantly. Just from, from a buyer's perspective, and you know what we've seen is, you have to consider the perimeter as the, the, primary, uh, the primary area that you really need to focus on and understand as a buyer. Because you know, if you think about the buying universe, you've got uh, strategics who want to look at it and have their own logic for you know, taking that car out and integrating it into their existing business versus private equity who may have one of two potentials. One is to integrate it into a portfolio company, or the other one is just to have it as a standalone business initially as a platform to, to buy and build. So it really, it really means that you've got to understand uh, what the perimeter is and be able to understand the level of entanglement because that's where the complexity really comes in. You know, there's uh, an entanglement with a parent company, many instances around the brand, sales force and customers, shared core operations, shared services such as an ERP platform. Then you've got to consider the dissynergies of taking that business out of the parent and you know, areas of the synergy are going to be around procurement, for example. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to deal with a lot of carve-outs, which are multi-jurisdictional. So then you need to deal with legal entities that you're inheriting and what their setup is, uh, what the tax regime considerations are going to be. So there's quite a lot to unpack here. And that's just only assessing it on the way into potentially buying it. It's then how do you plan to take the business standalone and more importantly, how do you optimize that business once you own it? Given it could be a bolt-on, it could be a uh, standalone that will become a buy and build, but you will typically inherit a business that needs to be optimized because it hasn't been optimized under the parent sufficiently because it's non-core. If I think about due diligence, you know, one of the challenges here is clearly getting the information that you need to make an informed opinion. So there's there's certainly a level of experience that you really need to bring to the mix in order to be able to anticipate in this business, in this sector, here are the things that I would consider based on my experience that I need to think through if I'm looking to buying this business and then, and then bolting it on or having it set up as a standalone. On the people side, this is something that um, I think doesn't get enough credit or focus it's how do you retain the knowledge? You keep that commercial and operational know-how in the business, but also balance that against getting new hires who need to execute a new strategy and avoid the status quo that prevailed under a parent. 
And then balancing the standalone, uh, the, the focus on taking the business on a standalone basis, while also trying to get to BAU as quickly as possible and transform. Um, and then thinking through the organizational design. So there's quite a lot, to, you know, a lot of challenges there. And then on the antitrust issue, you know, particularly in carve-outs that are then integrated into some sort of a strategic or, you know, as a, as a bolt-on, it's not really fully anticipating or satisfying antitrust requirements, which could cause quite a lot of delays. And all of this fundamentally plays into not preparing enough and getting into deal overruns, which could become quite costly uh, when you're looking at these carve outs. Yeah, sure. And just to go back to a couple, you know, the separation complexity and the perimeter, um, and also then linked to the due diligence, you know, from a technology point of view, absolutely critical to understand exactly where is that perimeter, because it's not so easy to un untangle the infrastructure, the operations and the applications and the data, you know, to say what belongs to the sales side and what belongs to the buy side, because most companies have worked hard to bring those together in order to build synergies in an organization. Um, I was recently doing a piece of work with a client, which was um, they, they brought us in to do some significant cost reduction of their IT budget. And um, they were just in the process in parallel of working through there. They'd just gone through day one. Um, they were on the buy side of, of a carve out and they hadn't done the due diligence. They hadn't had the access. And therefore, at the same time, we were finding opportunities to take cost out of their main uh, part of IT. So costs were being added in because they were finding out what they'd really bought and the complexities of what they'd really bought, which I think you know, really could have been avoided if they'd managed to get at least, you know, access has many different kinds in a due diligence, right? If you can't get full access, you can still get the right level of experienced people to ask the right kind of questions. Well, let me let me uh, see if I can trade war stories with you here a little bit, uh, uh, Catherine. There is one PE client that I had that was um, that had got exclusivity on the carve out of a very technical business uh, from a large European uh, energy business. And this was relatively high profile. And this is where the high risk element comes into it. Uh, they, you know, the PE fund spent a lot of money on the diligence side with commercial DD, ODD, ITDD, et cetera. But, you know, the challenge with due diligence, as you just said, it's not perfect. And um, they had put in a, a final bid, it got accepted, and they were negotiating the SPA and were also negotiating TSAs. And that's where it really uh, fell apart. The uh, TSAs, particularly on technology, were poorly conceived, not well thought through. The level of entanglement and the disclosure on it just became aware on a daily basis. It was surprise after surprise. And unfortunately, after about a four, six week effort of trying to negotiate this, the PE fund just had to walk away because they said it was just too messy and there was too much risk associated because they had no real visibility. And the, the real message here is it's not just businesses that suffer and the deal collapsed. It's also people because in this instance, the folks at the parent company who were responsible for this process lost their jobs. So you know, you've really got to anticipate this stuff. Absolutely. And I think we're definitely going to have to talk more about TSAs because they're such an important part of the carve out process. So if we move forward, then we're saying from our experience here, carve outs are typically high value, high risk, and they're complex transactions. So that means you need to have the knowledge, you need to have the skills to really anticipate and mitigate those risks. Um, that's a, a key element. So if we if we think here and we move on and let's go into just a little bit more detail. I think I'm keen to get more of your experiences. So, um, you know, the top half of the slide here is talking about the key areas of focus. Maybe we'll start with you, Nick, and talking about the value creation plan on the top right hand side of the slide. Thanks, Catherine. So, uh, I mean, as you see, high, high risk, but um, you know, if you get it right, um, they also can be potentially high, high reward, both for the vendor and, and for the buyer. Yeah, you know, so so certainly um, preparing a value creation plan is critical. Um, obviously, to be able to communicate the equity growth story 
to the buyers, but also from the vendor perspective, it's key to understanding the current and potential value of the business that's being carved out. Uh, you know, Moira, I've seen this many times, buyers, particularly private equity, they love carve-outs. Yeah. Largely because all too often corporates they don't go through that rigor of pre-exit performance improvement to identify upsides. They simply make the decision to exit and proceed with the sale. Now, obviously that brings speed, but the, the risk of that also uh, is of leaving value on the table to the benefit of the buyer. Um, and just, just to bring that into context, you know, a, a great example, um, a few years ago, I was advising a private equity buyer on a large beverage packaging business. Um, the business was of scale, it was, it was high levels of integration, um, including shared manufacturing lines. So from a car out perspective, it was complex. Yet the projections that they presented they were just not exciting. Um, you know, and so in terms of the, the, the trade-off between the likely effort to deliver the car buys and the potential growth story, it was of marginal interest. And, and certainly we reflected that in our first round bids. Nevertheless, we actually got through to the second round um, and you know, immediately went on to a sort of week-long site tours. Um, you know, and, and after that week, it was so clear um, there was no shortage of value creation in this business. Um, you know, machine staffing levels were too high. There was there was opportunities for site consolidation, reconfiguring workflows through through facilities to increase capacity. They weren't recycling scrap, etc. Um, and it was you know it was like flicking a light switch. You know, the whole dynamic of the deal changed. And the excitement for the deal from my client completely changed. You know? um, so at that point, they were completely hooked. Um, you know, and you know, we were successful. We acquired the business you know, 18 months post-deal. EBITDA had increased by 50%. And you know, so a few months thereafter, they actually exited and, and delivered a great return for the fund. Um, so from my, my client's perspective, a great story. Um, but obviously, from a vendor perspective, there was definitely value lost. So, you know, the message there is, you know, take, have the discipline and take that time to create the development creation plan. It doesn't all have to be implemented pre-sale, but you need to make it easy for buyers to see where the value lies. Um, you know, in my example, had the vendor taken that time to identify and present the value creation opportunities, the whole deal dynamics, the competitive tension of the situation would have been completely different, and no doubt they would have achieved a higher selling price. You know, so so that early preparation has a direct link to value. Um, of course, creating that plan is only the beginning. Mo, you do a lot of work on on post post day one on um, implementation. What what are the sort of key things from your side? Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, one thing we have to remember is why is a business getting carved out? Because it doesn't fit in this in the long-term strategy of a parent. And I think it's 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 fairly it's fairly clear that a lot of them are unloved uh, assets in the sense that they haven't had the focus, the intention, the bandwidth, the capital to really uh, uh, be able to deliver the potential that it has. And that's really the key word, the potential. So, and I'm a, uh, I mean, you guys know this, I am a, an implementation obsessed guy. Um, you know, the whole team that we have is very much focused on implementations. So when we think about these, uh, these carve outs and PE, certainly the, you know, the funds that we help, they're looking at the potential to really get that business fighting fit, agile, nimble, and ready to grow. And so when we think about it in those considerations, and I'll touch two or three of the topics that are on the slide, one is what's the op model that needs to be designed for this business? Because you can't just simply assume you're going to take it out of the parent and things are just going to continue tickety-boo the way that they have been. So it's just really thinking around what are the end markets that we should be focused on? You know, should we be end user market focused? Should we be regionally focused? Should we product and service line? Is it a matrix? What are the support functions that we need to set up and how should they operate? And what processes do we need to prioritize and reconfigure and, and optimize? What's the org design of this thing? What's the legal entity structure? Where should we be sitting? Where should the uh, 
the central uh, you know, decision making sit and what should it do? There's a lot to do here when you're trying to set up this business. And this is the catalyst. That carve out is the catalyst to, to think through the value creation opportunities and then deliver them because just planning them is not enough. There's a race against time to get that uh, standalone business optimized so that you can then, as a business owner, attack the strategy that you invested in in the first place. So it's, it's, it's quite a lot of really focusing the op model. What is it that we're going to do to deliver that strategy? And then making sure you've got the right people. You know, if I, if I think of an, uh, of an example now, there's a uh, footwear business that's being carved out of, uh, of a parent that is, I think it's fair to say it has been unloved. It's quite significant. It's a brand a lot of people would recognize. Um, and PE are looking at this, but they're also asking themselves, how do we identify the right management team, the right CEO, the right CFO? Because this re requires somebody with charisma and vision that can then you know, back it up with a track record. Because this isn't just about taking a business on a standalone basis. It's how do you reinvent the business? How do you reinvigorate it? How do you think about the markets globally that you want to play in? Your wholesale strategy. What kind of, how do you want to reposition the brand and the, uh, the footwear that you have available? So it's a lot of consideration that needs to go into it, but the value creation plan and the delivery of that is really what underwrites the investment thesis in the first place. Absolutely, and I think uh, you're absolutely right. We often get asked, don't we, about really helping with the operating model and not just the org design, but how does the organisation focus? I'm going to come back to this point then on TSAs that you touched on, Mo, on the last slide. You know, for me, TSAs is paramount to a carve-out process, getting them right. TSAs or transitional service agreements, they're essentially contracts, right? They're legal documents. The, the final legal wording should be prepared by the legal team, but it starts with the content from everybody in the business, yeah? Con contributing to the content of what the TSA should look like. And, you know, from an IT perspective, having a detailed understanding of the IT estate to know which systems you're carving out, which ones you're reliant on, which ones less so, how you think you can separate them, in what time scale do you think you can separate. All of that information is critical input to the TSAs in terms of negotiating both the duration of the TSA and the associated cost. And I can think of, uh, you know, numerous examples, actually, where the TSA element has been too optimistic. The TSA process has been too optimistic. You know, thinking that you can just separate from the IT systems in a complex company within six or 12 months, baking that into the contractual arrangements into the TSAs. You know, and I, I, I immediately think of a, of, a, of a company that we worked with where they had no, they were not able to do that. But the penalties associated with not being able to carve out or separate or move off of those systems within 12 months, the penalties associated with that were high. Because, of course, that's the element of the contract. If you don't meet the contract, you pay the penalties. So for me, this goes back to the preparation point that if you invest the time in truly understanding the TSA duration, for each of your individual cluster of systems, if you like, you can have short TSAs, you can have long TSAs, and you can agree some TSAs that are two to three years if that happens to be the deal that you can come to between buyer and seller. And there may be um, applications or systems you can come up with in six months. But I think it's that element of taking away the element of surprise there. Um, so I think, you know, that would be key for me. I'm really aware of uh, time, but what I just wanted to say is you know, we've put a number of IT points at the bottom here of this slide, really, because if we think of the high complexity functions, finance, legal, shared services and IT, IT is typically the one where there are so many hidden, hidden things to know. And I know, Mo, you, you and I have both done a number of IT uh, separations. So, you know, we can circulate these slides, right, and people can, can look at these points and follow up um. with Maybe, Catherine, if I may, because there's one thing that I think is also quite important, and, and you, you, you raise it as you were talking about TSAs, you know, um, thinking about the standalone costs, the one-off and the recurring costs is absolutely important when you think about how do you prepare uh, for, for the car bout and what you need to consider when you're buying uh, a, a car bout business. 
And it really sits with the TSAs. I really call TSAs, and you've heard me say this before, they're a necessary evil. They're just really expensive and really you, you want to get off them uh, pra as practically and as quickly as you can. And that's fundamentally because the costs are not just about the delays on the TSA, but in parallel, you're setting up a standalone organization and processes and capabilities that are running in parallel with the TSAs. So your costs are duplicated. And so any delays really hit your standalone uh, recurring and one-off costs. And this is stuff that needs to be really balanced carefully. Absolutely, I'm, I'm with you there. So just aware we've got a, about four minutes to go. And so let's move on. And, and as we bring this discussion, this webinar to a close, I mean, we've put on the slide 10 key takeaways, but I'm going to ask you, Nick, you know, what would be your top three or give me your, your highlights here of things that we should all yeah, I'll, I, I'll, I'll try and be quick because, as, as, as we as we all know, there's so much to talk about in, in terms of carve out. So I'll try and be succinct. So, like I think for me, um, we've heard it a number of times through the conversation today. You know, the message is simple: it's around prepare, prepare, prepare. So much, so much better to take that time up front before the business is exposed to the market to fully prepare for a carve out. You know, the early stage of that preparation phase. Ensure there's clarity around the deal perimeter, what assets, what products and people are in and out of scope. You know, how are the relevant employees going to be motivated and engaged through the protest? Because these are tough. These are tough and they can be long processes. Um, so you need to keep them focused on that end goal. Um, what's the target operating model? You know, and for me, we always try and look at this on a should-be basis rather than just taking the business as is. A carve-out is a great opportunity to really challenge the status quo um, pre-exit to ensure it's optimum, any surplus costs or assets are identified. Um, and that obviously also plays into the value creation plan that, that we've talked about. You know, targeting that operation, that optimum operating model can help identify everything from margin improvement, cost reduction opportunities, um, you know, and these should either be implemented pre-sale or roadmapped for the buyer to implement. But either way, it all goes towards establishing value. Um, I think the second point from this slide I'd highlight is to make sure your numbers are bulletproof. You know, the historical financials must be as accurate as possible. Not always easy if it's a you know, if it's a business unit being carved out. Um, you know, they must take account of corporate allocations, um, standalone costs that must be reflected. Um, and how they can be substantiated. You know, financials, whether it's a historic or the business plan, must be credible. They must stand up to due diligence. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen many sales processes um, fail. You know, because carve out financials. You know, they sort of unravel partly through the process. So confidence in the numbers is also. Right. Thanks, Nick. And just uh, finally, Mo, from you, what would be your... Uh, yeah, just you? super fast. I'd say prioritize speed over elegance. So don't aim for perfection to get to day one. Just be pragmatic. Get what you need to get to day one. And then, you know, make sure you've got that value creation plan developed so that post day one, you can have that relentless focus on the value creation opportunities. And then lock in the right governance, which means have a really strong PMO to drive that value creation implementation. And I, thanks, Mo. And I'm just going to pick on what you said, you know, this relentless focus on value creation post day one, which is where you specialise, but also, you know, prioritising speed over elegance, which doesn't mean don't do your preparation. It means work out what you need to do to get to where you need to be um, in order to make the smooth day one go, go well. And then you can start to build your value out post day one and that's kind of the work bit that you've talked about today so I would definitely say don't underestimate the complexity and take time on the negotiations and I think you know what we've, what we've said today is carve outs are complex but there is a path through to separation with the right amount of, of a, attention to planning and preparation you know and what you've told us Mo about really making sure you continue to focus post the day one process we are out of time for the questions and I can see a nice few number of questions coming in. What I promise to do is we will respond to the questions 
We will circulate the slides and we will circulate the Q&A for everybody to read. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Nick, for Hello. joining us today. And thanks, everybody, for joining the webinar. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you soon.